right, this week's podcast title is Entrepreneurial Finance 101, Avoiding the Profit Leaks. And I'm so excited to introduce Howard Shaw, founder and CEO of the Activate Group, which helps ambitious and high growth companies develop the ideal business strategy, increase profit, and improve management through executive and business coaching. Howard is also a scaling up and metronomics CEO and team certified coach, a national speaker, and best selling author of The Leader Launchpad and Your Business is a Leaky Bucket. Howard is also a certified public accountant and brings unique, simple, and practical coaching tools and entrepreneurial finances to his client brace. Howard, I'm so thrilled to have you on the show. We uh, we go back two decades at that very least. We're uh, we're best friends, and um, I couldn't imagine a better person to to meld coaching as well as entrepreneurial finance. Because over the years, that's what has been a great coach to me. I've often been so um, enamored and impressed with how you're able to break down the practicalities and simple tools of finance to entrepreneurs. So I'm thrilled to have you on the show, Howard. Thank you so much for having me. And and I, as you're going down the list, I'm like, you missed the most important credential. Go ahead. I've got friends like you. Oh, I mean, man. Thank you. you, man. Oh, thank, thank you. Love you too, man. Love you too. All right. And back at you. All right. So in the Activate framework, Howard, you emphasize the importance of tracking critical numbers. What key financial metrics do you find most impactful for businesses looking to scale up? All right. So I do want to set a precedent here. Yeah. I know this is a financial uh, uh, podcast. Yes. And I know you wanted to drill in all of that, but I want to set the stage for everybody here. All of these different financial tools, all of these different metrics, they're just a snapshot to frame where you're at. We spend, particularly in the financial world, way too much time getting everything perfect and looking at the picture. And the story is what we're going to create. Yeah. So all of these things we're going to talk about is for context only. It's not a silver bullet. The silver bullet and it, it, all those metrics do is tell us how good were our decisions in the past and how well did we execute on our decisions? And then if you just have a number that tells you were you good or bad, and then it's just like a book, you know, we have different chapters and any of us who've read books, you got to get all the way to the end and hopefully all of us have a long journey still. So the first few chapters, we may not like the chapters. We not like what we're reading, what we're seeing, but the reality is, as soon as you have that number, that snapshot for last month, yesterday, last year, we're right in the new chapter. And it's the new chapter and those decisions you're going to make because of the new information you have at any given point in time that is going to shape whether those numbers look good or bad in the future. It's not really about the number. The number is just the context. Perfect. All right. So with that framework, <laughs> let's talk about some of the key metrics and some of the tools that are most impactful businesses that you found, even if it's to provide a context. I hear exactly. Perfect, what perfect. So, and what's interesting is, is the tools and the context we need is going to be different depending on an organization situation. For example, break even. It's a common metric that business owners need to know, but only at two points in time as they're starting it up and when their decisions weren't so great so the cash flow is sucky because the rest of the time and and richard you can confirm this when our businesses are great do we even calculate break even do we even care no we don't so sometimes you've got to ask yourself if we're why are we using this metric and is this a scaling metric because I got it going well, or is this a metric because I really am not making good decisions and then I'm incrementally try to improve a bad business. So I would be careful with that. But for example, break even is important for companies that haven't quite figured out and navigated a good business model. Uh, other measures that I like quite a bit, which is different than the way most people look at income statements, uh, and I'm constantly trying to read direct, direct CFOs, most people like to look at uh, things as a percentage of revenue. Payroll is the biggest cost. 
And I always needed a metric. I wanted to understand, and this works in every business, but more importantly, I think in the scaling business to make sure we're scaling is labor efficiency ratio, which I give Greg Crabtree all the credit of, of that ratio. It's very different than percentage of revenue. What it's telling me is for every dollar I pay in payroll, how many dollars is it returned back? It's not a percentage. And, and what it helps you do is it helps you avoid getting all caught up in, well, what hourly rate am I going to pay this person? Or what should their annual salary be? Because I can tell you, you can take a mediocre person and then you're going to pay mediocre and you're never going to like that ratio or it's nowhere near where it needs to be. So by looking at the ratio, when somebody comes to me and they say, I want to add a body, I'm great. How much gross margin are we going to add because we added that body? Um, I need to have higher salary for my team. Great. So for every dollar I spend, how much extra contribution am I going to get so they win and we win as the owners? So I really like that as a measure. And, and then what happens is you can do it at a higher level, um, direct labor efficiency, overhead labor efficiency, and if it's relevant, sales labor efficiency. But then you can go by department. You can go by function. Uh, you can look at a whole group of people doing the same things, and you can see the different labor efficiencies. And when we've done that in the past, we'll see sometimes the people we think are the best people actually have lower contribution for every dollar we spend on them. And the other people, which we didn't uh, appreciate as much are actually contributing more for every dollar we invest in them. And it's important to see that. And then when you look at that variability, you can start asking questions. Why does so-and-so contribute this much, four to one, and this one only does two to one? What's the difference? Why? And with all the ratios, and you know, I went deeper into this one just for fun, the why is the most important discussion. Why is this number what it is? And what can we do as an executive team to make that ratio or whatever measure we're using change and understanding the differences between our people? It creates great dialogues. And to me, the devil in going through your financials or anything is the dialogue around why and how might we change the whole story. Awesome. All right. Okay. We are going to talk about labor productivity. I know that's one of your big points um, that you've uh, you've often kind of talked about in, in, in your books. Let's talk about one of the things you mentioned, you know, very simple framework, percentage of revenue, right? And you have guided me, you know, over the years. You said, Look, Richard, show this tool, this one plus one plus one. I'm saying, Howard, what are you talking about? So you showed that. And I tell you one thing, Howard, to the entrepreneurial type companies, I've, I've shown that. And I would say 90% of the people hadn't thought of financial performance that way. If little tweaks in their business, I know there's a lot behind little tweaks, but on a piece of paper, at least demonstrating the power of one plus one plus one at revenue at margin and then in your costs, what it could do to the bottom line. Explain to the audience what, what that tool is and why it's, why it's so powerful. So... The reason it was powerful and it was important to me is after looking at thousands of financial statements, it seemed to me that people were chasing revenue everywhere and anywhere. And it was not turning into what they thought would happen on the bottom line. And most of the time, companies were growing a lot and, and just getting indigestion. They didn't even feel good after they grew so much, right? So, you know, I started playing around with numbers and I'm like, all right, let me just take a simple client. And I remember the one that I used in the book. In the sales process, they were a classic example. They grew 52% and they almost went bankrupt. Not for the reasons you think. It wasn't the growth rate. It was so much mismanagement. It was just, I couldn't believe actually how easy it was to move the numbers. But they were just like massive about growth. And I said, well, let me play with some numbers with you here in a whiteboard. So they were doing about 10 million in revenue, pretty much no profit. And their balance sheet was off. And we won't even talk about balance sheets now. And I said, all right, so you grew 52% last year and you basically made exactly the same amount of money as you did last year. 
you would have to agree that this is not a great model. And the owner's like, but we'll make it up in volume. I said, you already tried volume. That didn't work. All right. So all you're going to do is, so let's grow another 100% and make the same money next year. Then where are you? He's like, well, but then I'll have scale. Like, well, what do you mean by scale? You'll have, all you just have is a lot more work to do and you're making no money to do all that extra work. And he, they couldn't prove to me in the room, the leadership team, that as they got bigger, so obviously there are organizations, I have ownership in software companies and all of that. You have to get to a certain point before it starts turning into cash. Yep. That was not the case here. So I said, let's just have some fun. Let's take your 10 million. We're going to grow only 1% this year. They're like, we can do a lot more than that. I said, I'm not going to stop you from growing. Let's just add 1%. I said, all right, now what I want you to do is I want you to expand gross margin by 1%. So that means as a percentage of revenue, their cost of sales dropped. So now you have an extra basis point for how this is going to go through. And then I said, now let's talk about scale. So my overhead uh, is going to not grow as fast as revenue. So that's going to drop 1% of revenue. And I said, all right, so what do you guys think 1 plus 1 plus 1 is going to equal? They said, three. I said, well, okay, that's the, that's the normal math. Very good. You learned elementary school. It doesn't work in running a business. <laughs> the number was their bottom line grew 42%. Yep. And so I said, what we need to talk about is the components that could make those things happen. And if you get volume, great, but we've got to start looking at the formula of the contributions of each of the pieces. And, and long story short, that particular company, back of the envelope in the room, because I just started asking some of those decision questions I talked about earlier. I said, if we made different decisions, what should gross margin be? And what should profit margin be? When we got done, we came up with a 20% number and then everyone's like, oh, it can't be right. And they kept redoing it. I said, all right, listen, we can spend our whole lives trying to precisely come up with the right number. We have a directional number. Within nine months of making a few different decisions, they actually had 20% net profit. Yep. Which cleaned up their whole balance sheet and actually created a war chest for them. And they went out and did an acquisition. And now we were scaling. But they were too worried about it. And so the big lesson for everybody here is, I'm not saying you don't want to grow, but you don't have to grow at all. And you can increase your bottom line by 100%. And sometimes you're better off just shrinking, dropping off a bad line of business, a bunch of bad clients, and be smaller, but have a lot more return for all of your effort. And it's really hard for us as entrepreneurs to go backwards and say that, you know what, I'm going to cut my revenue in half. Well, I've seen companies do that and four and five times the profit they make off of every dollar they generate. Uh, so we want to get in the discussion. So the, the other lesson is everybody thinks we have to do huge things to change our bottom line by huge amounts. But in this case, most companies would die to grow their bottom line by 42%. Let alone we did five times in one year and there was only three changes in decision-making of how we ran the business that allowed us to, to four and five times their net profit and their cash flow in nine months. So that's the lesson is what are the fewest things that dramatically change your business model that are just small changes in thinking sometimes that's going to move those numbers. Perfect. Perfect. So let, let's talk about the first bus stop when it comes to profitability. Gro and you mentioned it, gross margin improvement. All right. So you talk about the importance of improving gross margin. So what actionable steps or tools do you suggest to entrepreneurs to enhance their gross margins without compromising quality? Good question. But here's where I want you guys to be careful. So many folks are focused on gross margin percentage that they miss the boat. Yep. I'll give you a stupid example. In the construction industry, I had a client a number of years ago uh, want to pass on, and you got a picture, they're about a $15 million company. They want to pass on a $2 million job, which by the way, they subcontract out. They don't do any of the work because they're used to 45% of 
uh, margins on their business. And this was only 20%. So I'm like, all right, let me understand this. So you want to pass on a $2 million roof that's going to bring you $400,000 of gross profit. And let me ask you two questions. How much work is it going to take you to do that? Oh, it's almost, it's all paperwork. We're going to hand it out. They're going to do it. We're going to invoice. We're going to bill it. What's your risk on having to do rework or anything? Nothing, because we outsource. So we have no risk. Paperwork, how many hours do you think that paperwork is? It was almost nothing. So the contribution of time was like no more than 20 hours to generate $400,000 of profit. They were going to pass on that job when their average size job was only about 10 to 15,000. How many jobs would they have had to do to generate $400,000 of profit? So one thing I want you to be careful of is gross margin percent is important, but be careful how you're looking at the decision. Uh, because many times there's no overhead. There's excess capacity that's being unused and we can really get gross margin up by understanding our excess capacity that we're gonna run more things through our system and there is no extra direct labor cost because the direct labor was already paid for and idle. So we've got to make different decisions. So when I look at gross margin, I ask myself three questions. And I'm going to ask this, by the way, in every part of your P&L. Yeah. It's people, process, and innovation. So do, is my gross margin not where it needs to be because I have the wrong people? Is my gross margin where it's, it is because I don't hold people accountable? Is my gross mar my my people problem? I don't have clear expectations of everybody, so I have them running around. And so I'm going to say a lot of the margin leak for a lot of businesses is complete mismanagement of that direct labor. And right seats, right people produce completely different outcomes. And so typically, I like to calculate the cost of mishires the cost of open positions. So think about it this way. I can't generate margin if I don't, if it requires direct labor and I don't have the labor. And I can't tell you how many companies push out their revenue because they didn't hire fast enough. Um, and I can't tell you how many companies because they're so focused on minimizing labor cost that they actually get less gross margin because those people are incompetent. The second thing I'm going to look at where your margin leaks out is bad processes. So some organizations don't have the SOPs where they need to. But typically, if you look at the process, there's usually one or two leaks in your process that are causing 80% of the, the margin leak. So what I want to do is I want to look at my processes, see where the most mistakes are happening, where the most rework occurs, where all the problems are happening and I want to fix those processes. Here's the funny thing about the two things I just told you right now. Your P&L isn't going to tell you this. The P&L is going to tell you, only tell you, I don't like my gross margin dollars or my gross margin percents. It's not going to tell you, I didn't staff right, I didn't hold them accountable right, and it didn't tell you my processes suck. All right, now let's say we got past those two things. The last piece is now I got to think innovation. This is model change. Model change is what am I doing that if I outsourced it and it's not going to affect quality? Because by the way, the first two things I told you actually improves quality and grows gross margin. The last one could be riskier because when I start depending on other organizations to get things done, there's risk. So once you start outsourcing party operations, one of our clients, the way in which we completely changed their business model was all of their employees were in the U.S. And we realized that 100% of their business could be done outside of the U.S. So now they're working in different parts of the world for different parts of their, um, their product and service, so to speak, at one-fourth the cost. They have not lowered their standard. Actually, quality went up service went up. All of what they were doing was done with U.S. labor costs. Now, some of you are like, want to stay in America. I get it. It's wonderful. But then don't complain 
that you're not getting gross margin you see some of your competitors do. <laughs> the other thing is, is there's things that we suck at. I've got a client, they're basically a distributor, all right? They, they, so the reason they exist is the manufacturers need a showroom and they need someone to sell their stuff and then service as the, the product goes out to the customer. That's what they need to be best in the world at. You know what they suck at, Richard? Supply chain. They're yeah. awful. So they're always hemorrhaging cash because they're so bad at moving goods all the way through the system and leveraging a global supply chain. Well, I watched them for two years just suffer and suffer. Well, we'll just hire the right people. We'll try this. And I'm like, you'll never get there where the big three PLs are. Never. So and they're in the process of outsourcing that. That'll actually, um, on their bottom line, that move alone can actually double their bottom line. And it's going to increase speed. They carry less inventory. Customers will be happier because they'll be more just in time. These are examples of real life experiences. But again, all of this is decisions and how we lead. Your P&L doesn't have a line item above in, in direct cost of, I really suck at managing people. I am bad at picking people. I am bad at creating organizational design. I'm bad at creating SOPs. I don't outsource what I shouldn't. There's no line item for any of those things. There's only a result. So what I would challenge everybody to do is think about those decisions and really narrow down and prioritize what's first, what's second in terms of moves you can make. Because then the next quarter and the quarter after now, money just shows up and it can be the same exact revenue line item. Perfect. And you bring a fantastic wisdom bite there, Howard, because, you know, the p and is a, is a financial statement with a number, but the bottom line is a sum total of the, the decisions you make and the processes you have and how efficient and effective those are. It's just a sum total of the activities that go on in the company. Now, I want to add one more thing, and you mentioned it about sucking cash and the gross margin equation. There's um, part of this, which you've almost got to link your gross margin to how much you've got to invest to create that gross margin. And typically it's on the working capital side. And what many businesses don't understand is you may create $1 of gross margin, but how much does it take to support that? And for every dollar of product or service you sell, does it take more than that in AR, in inventory or so forth, at which the simple rule is, is with every dollar you're selling of that, you may be sucking cash. So there's a tool we use. I'm so glad you bring yes. that up. Yep. And you know, there's a you know a lot of business services companies, and there's a lot of industries out there. This doesn't matter to, you. but for for anybody who carries big receivables, that can get very lengthy, and there's a big mismatch between when you actually pay your team and when you actually collect from your providers. This is a what what Richard is bringing up is crucial, and so we use a tool with our clients which any one of you can buy, go to cashflowstory.com. Uh, they're based out of Australia. They originally used to support investment banks and they realized entrepreneurs needed to start looking at what bankers were looking at, investors were looking at, buyers were looking at. Uh, and what they realized was, you know, how many people have you worked with over the years, Richard, went to the bank and the bank's like, I won't fund you. And the owner's like, they just don't understand our business. Well, what they're really telling you is you may understand your industry and how money gets made in your industry, but you don't understand cash flow and your cash flow model is horrible, which is what Richard's getting at here. And that's why you're not getting funded. You can talk a great story. At the end of the day, they have to make sure money's going to come back in a way that they can get their loan paid down and their loan is not at risk. So we use cashflowstory.com. And what it does is it says for every... And one of the pages in there says for every $100 of growth, how much working capital is it going to take to generate every dollar? And then what we look at is the gross margin, uh, either dollar for the same 100 or percent versus the working capital dollar or right. percent 
the closer that is, the more likely you've got a bad business model. 100%. Now, for you, those of you who are not financial people, you don't have to worry about anything. You just put it into the system. It spits it out. And then you it's either red or green on the bottom. Either your business model can self-fund itself or it can't. And it'll even tell you whether you're going to be able to fund based on your model, whether somebody's going to want to fund that. And I, it's a great tool. That there's imperfections just like any other model that's built off of standard formulas. But it starts tying together those decisions because one of the things you need to understand is your model. Uh, that there, there's a couple of things that I really worry about and, and owners are surprised how quickly we get there is I wanna understand the three to five triggers that are most important impactors of whether you'll ever hit those budgets you're dreaming about. And we really need to get to those drivers rather than uh, what you want your P&L to look like. Yep. And can we make those drivers happen? Uh, but at the end of the day, you've got to be able to fund whatever your your wild dream is. And balance sheet is a critical component of that as, as you go forward. And is managed the same way as we talked about the same example in gross margin. Well, my days receivable, how long it takes me to collect. Uh, there's three things that we can do to change that. The first one, is fix our process, right? So many companies, they don't realize that accounts receivable happens across the organization, not in the receivables departments. Right. Everybody has a hand in doing that. Like, do we get billing out even fast enough or is it held up and it's taking a month after we finish the work to get our money? That's a leak. That's not gonna happen in accounts. Accounts receivable, it's not even billed yet. They don't have anything to bill. That's an operational problem, right? So you got to understand the entire cycle and continue to shrink the process. Second one is, do I have the right person leading that entire cycle? So we're back to a people question. And then the third question you have to ask is, how can I innovate collections altogether? So, um, you know, we made a decision at Activate Group a number of years ago. We don't collect checks anymore. But we don't have receivables. We will not take a client unless they treat us like the rest of their employees. And we're on ACH and they pay us according to the schedule, just like they do any other employee. All we are is a subcontracted employee. So we went from having receivables to no receivables by making, and by the way, they're, they're, you, you're going to have companies you can't do business with. Their cash flow doesn't allow for it. Or that's not their philosophy. We just won't do business with them. It was a strategic decision that I was going to get out of the collections business. I love it. I love it. Now, I'm going to digress a little because you raise a really good point about critical business operations and picking on billing, for example. How important is it, How let's talk at entrepreneurial stage or scaling up, that you lay out what that business process looks like? Because billing is a critical process. It impacts everything in the business and ultimately cash flow, you know? How important is it? And then how important is it to have a business owner around that, that entire process, or maybe segments of it, and then a KPI at the end to hold that person or to, to monitor progress and to hold that person accountable? How you important stole, is that? You just stole my thunder. So here's oh, the- man, I'm sorry. I, we've been friends for 20 years. You would expect that, <laughs> wouldn't you? <laughs> so, so what's interesting is, is everyone that's listening to this, you have to understand the six most important processes, somewhere around five to six key processes drive the entire cash flow of your business. From, uh, from the spending of the cash to the billing of the cash, the collection of the cash to the, your payables and all of that, there, there's six key processes in organization. And the first question you've got to ask is who owns each key process? Because your processes go across the organization. It's no one department. And so typically when we say, who owns receivables? I cringe when they say it's the accounts receivable clerk. And so then I'll ask the question, how much money do you flow through accounts receivable a year? It'd be 50, $100 million. How much do you pay your person that does accounts receivable? Be 50, 60,000. All right, so you have a $60,000 person is that person even got the ability to manage the entire chain 
and fight with the COO and whoever they need to fight with so they can shorten the cycle. Oh no, they don't go outside of the department. So you have to have an owner that has the influence to be able to drive the improvements across the chain. And accounts receivable is usually the one that everyone complains about and is the most mismanaged. Number one, because the lack of ownership. They're expecting a clerk who is very good at following procedure. They want them to create the procedure, design the process and manage the organization and improve that. That's failure. And you could do that with a lot of the processes uh, in, in the organization. Um, and many times I'm amazed. And by the way, I've owned a number of businesses. You know, I owned my first one. I was 18. Yes. I'm surprised I made a dime. I go back now and I'm just like the chaos that was going on. The fact that any money wound up back in my pocket was, was, was crazy. Right. Yeah. But everybody's got to really... You got to understand your business model from an operational standpoint, from a market standpoint, but you also need to understand it from a financial standpoint. So one of the things that I use that I don't know if you've ever heard of the key function flow map. So what we do is there's a, usually anywhere between three to five key functions in an organization. Most organizations marketing where opportunities come in, sales, or they either get converted or they don't, and they get priced properly and all of that. Uh, then typically there's some sort of an operations budget bucket and operations is actually how you actually generate revenue, not sales, because they then convert those customers into money. And then however well they do that, it generates a margin. And then typically there's financial component like, like receivables. We have some that are more complicated than that, but most business owners, when I ask them, okay, so let's map out how money flows through your company, they can't do it. Yep. That's they can't. Awesome. Even no offense, the CFO struggle, because they're so used to debits and credits and all that. I'm like, stop with all of that. And usually what we'll wind up with is for each function, we have one key, maybe two keating leading indicators, then yep. the lagging indicator for each one of the functions. Most everybody is focused on the lagging indicator and it's the leading indicator that really matters. So for example, if I don't sell a certain amount of dollars, I'll never see revenue. Most people don't know the difference between sales and revenue. When you, when you ask them, they're like, I don't know. And then they don't know what measures. And so then I've run into companies where they have dashboards of 250 or more KPIs. And I'm like, do you know why your business is functioning or not? And we're normally able to take out six to 10 metrics. And we can tell the health of the business at any given point in time. And I want everybody that's listening to this to boil your company down to, to six to 10 metrics. Yep. Have a target for every one of them, an improvement plan for every one of them, and monitor them like a religion. And you'll never have to worry about your PL again or your balance sheet. Absolutely. Okay. So don't hold us in suspense. What were the five drivers? You mentioned five drivers about five minutes ago. What are the five key drivers? It depends on the business. So I'm trying to think of the context of what you're saying. So it really depends on the business. So uh, uh, a distribution company that I'm talking to today, and I boiled down their business. The CEO couldn't believe how quickly I grasp what his management team did grasp. I'm like, listen, the only way we're going from 35 million to 100 million in the next two years, we need a certain amount of things. You need to have the ability to buy that much product. You need the, you, you need the distribution rights, you need the vendors, and you need the cash flow. If I can't purchase enough then I can't sell that. Do you know how many units it's going to take to do that? So we broke it down into units. To do 100 million, this is how many units and, and, and the three major lines that you're going to have to flow through. Do you know where those are coming from? So that's on the operational side. On the sales side, believe it or not, to generate 35 million, they probably have about 30 customers. So I'm like, that's great. So we can find more things to sell those customers 
but most of your growth is going to be our ability to increase that customer base. Yep. And before we started that dialogue, do you know how many people they had in sales to grow the customer base? One. All right, so you want to grow basically three times your size through one person. So we realized we didn't have enough resources to add that number of customers to sell enough product to because every customer has a certain density of you're only going to get a certain amount of share in that customer. And they were pretty much milking the ones they had. So first number for them, how many customers do you have? <laughs> Right. Second, and I can't share their model, I can't tell you anymore, yeah, yeah. but they needed a certain number of stores to justify how much they were going to buy. So it was it was it was actually retail presence. Then they needed buying how many units they were going to buy. And for that business, knowing those three numbers, I can tell you whether they're going to hit their numbers or not. So that one is not even five levers. Collection, not an issue in their business. Um, and then, by the way, those key numbers drive a lot of decisions. How many warehouses do I need? Where do I need to put them? How much volume do I need to put through that? What does my transportation and logistics need to happen? What systems do I need to process four times the number of transactions, three times the number of transactions? Um, but the key driver of letting all those other departments know, be, be, beware, this is what's coming for those key numbers. So, 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 so Howard, because now you herein lies the big issue. You know, you've been around the block with, with, you know, many of your, your coaching clients and so on. Right. So, and I've been in many businesses where I'd come in as a CFO and say, well, how does this business really make money? And people look at me, um, you know, they think they'll propose how the business makes money, which is not really how they make money. So what's your advice about getting down? How should business approach getting down to what those key, maybe five drivers are? Because you laid out a good one in the distribution industry, because that's that's the issue. People look at P&L, oh, this is how I make money. No, it's not how you make money. There's a layer or two below that, whether it's KPIs that really show you and demonstrate the path to making money. So, so obviously I use a framework. Yes. Key function flow maps my framework and I create a discussion around it. Yeah. And through that, we co-decide as an organization, this is how money throws for our organization. It's illuminating for everybody. Yep. Uh, so, so you can use tools and frameworks. At the end of the day, um, you have to boil down your business so that you can explain it to your child. Yeah. You haven't simplified it that much I'm going to challenge everybody that's listening to this. You really don't understand your business well enough. Every business owner I go to is, Howard, you just don't understand. Our business is complicated. There's a lot of moving parts. And then we're down to like five to 10 numbers. It's not that complicated. They're making it complicated. And because they're looking at so many things, they, they, they're losing sight on what matters. So sometimes you have to have somebody help you figure that out. Sometimes you got somebody brilliant like Richard that understands, I don't really care about debits and credits. I really worry about how are we going to make money? How do you make money? And how does that story need to change? Because then everything else we can put together, just the dialogue alone of getting everybody in their room on your leadership team to argue over how do we really make money? You know, what are the key drivers that if those things don't happen, we're just not going to like this. And, and then therein lies which is how you make better businesses because every one of those points has a constraint. Yes. And so we're managing the law of constraints. So if my volume goes in, well, now my operations may have indigestion. If volume comes in faster than operations is ready, right? So you're constantly having these cycles that you have to understand the constraint is constantly moving, kind of a uh, gold rat was his name with the goal, right? As yeah. soon as I fix one constraint, another yeah. one pops up and then another one pops up. And then I'm all the way back to the beginning where the constraint started so yeah. that I keep growing faster and faster and faster. And as Jim Collins talks about as a flywheel, 
is how do we get this thing moving faster and faster? So eventually it has momentum. We can't even explain why it's growing so fast. But the only way you can do that is by really brutally um, debating amongst the team how to make sure that not only the leadership team understands, but everybody in the company understands how they're going to make that flywheel turn easier. And that truly is what scaling is all about. So every dollar you're adding more contributes to the bottom line faster than ever before. And growth should be getting easier and easier. Where right now, how many organizations go into Richard are like, I don't want to grow anymore. They already have indigestion, right? They didn't build the organization in a way so that it could scale. Eventually, you want to get to the point where everybody is like, oh, you want to double next year? <laughs> Not a problem. We got this. And you can only do that by simplification. Yeah. Um, so let me put a little bit of bow around this one from a financial standpoint. Um, there's a golden rule, which is you really only make, and it's called a triple, triple overlap the triple financial overlap, you really only make money when three things intersect. Howard, and then we'll move on to more of your cash flow tactics in a minute. Um, it's when you have a net profit, it's when you have when you generate positive cash flow and when you have a return on assets. The intersection, because what you're doing now is you're linking, these are all financial statements, but you're linking the activities now, right? Where right. you actually make you 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 make a you make a profit that intersects because you can make a profit on paper. Howard, and you may be draining cash flow. That's how businesses go Correct. bankrupt. So you must have a positive net, net cash flow. And if you're seeking investment and so forth, and even managing your own balance sheet and your assets, you must have a positive rate of return on your assets. When those three intersect is really when you make money. So, so actually, the way we can help them is the seven levers, right? Yep. So we all have seven levers we've got to watch. Uh, revenue. There's two ways in which you can grow revenue. I can increase volume or I can change price. And actually some of our biggest success stories are getting them to wrap their head around price differently. Yeah. So those are two levels that we have. The other one we've already talked about is how to, how to expand our gross margin. So as yep. revenue is coming through, how do we turn more and more of it into to money, right? And then there's overhead. And then there, most people are growing overhead faster than revenue. And then they're not understanding that that formula is wrong. And most people think you have to spend money to make money. And I said, maybe, maybe, but usually not incrementally as much when you start getting into those indirect costs. And then, so that you have those four levers on your P&L, that's it. And then on your balance sheet, this depends on your business model now, folks. Pretty much almost everybody, unlike me, has receivables. All right. So at the end of the day, you've got to figure out how to improve that fifth lever. Your sixth lever is payable. That's free financing. So we're trying to match up the cycle between when I pay money out and how I get money in. And the more I can work with vendors to match that or make it better, the better my business model. And then last one is inventory. Little piles of money sitting in warehouses in different places. And how do I increase turns, which is why I've been picking on that that, that um, distribution company about supply chain. They carried three times the amount of inventories what they really needed last year. What a disaster. So there's no oxygen. It's all tied up in the warehouses, not producing any money and spending money to go sit in the warehouse, right? So we're gonna lose those seven levers. And then I want everybody to think seven levers, what do I need to do in the people area? Uh, am I getting rid of non-performers very, very quickly? <laughs> am I filling seats fast enough with the right people? Um, and then am I fixing my processes? And then am I really being innovative in my thinking of what I'm going to do? And we could talk about every single one of those levers and different ways to move it. But when you're doing your planning meetings, always think uh, people, process, innovation, for each lever and then figure out which lever we need to put the most attention on now. Love it. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Okay. We'll close out the uh the point from an entrepreneurial standpoint. You've seen, you know, many businesses. Let's talk a little bit about cash flow management. And obviously, obviously a, a challenge for most growing businesses. 
What cash acceleration strategies or tools do you recommend, especially during the early periods of expansion? So it's funny, you, you can separate what we just talked about. Yeah. So what you so cash flow is a combination of what you said, you know, um, cash flow is, is it, am I making money on what I'm selling? And am I using up too much money to generate that profit? So if it's all sitting on my balance sheet, I'm losing, right? So we can't really separate the discussion. Um, and I, ironically, like I do use cash flow story and stuff like that to understand the cash flow model. But most of our clients that have to worry about break even, they're they're tracking cash flow weekly and they're they're robbing Peter to pay Paul. I'll say in most of those cases, you probably have a business model problem mm -hmm. or you have a mindset problem. So the more constrained you are in cash flow, Richard, you know this, the worse your decision making becomes. Yes. I miss opportunities. I pass on opportunities, right? I don't hire the best people. I don't go after the best ways because I work within too small a box. It's like putting a bowling ball and trying to stick it through a pinhole. You could wish all you want that it's going through, it ain't, right? So when I'm seeing cash constrained, my biggest challenge is to people, and a lot of them, I don't want to give up a piece of my business. I don't want to take on debt. Most of your business models, you have to, or it's going to be glacial to get out of the mess you're in, right? So if I incrementally, and I only want to self-fund, then your growth for a lot of businesses has to be much slower. Because that business, if I'm going to constrain and hold everything in this tight, tight box, then I'm going to grow out of this mess much slower. Or I can have a really solid business model, which by the way, then banks will fund, right? Or I need to go out and get partners because we want to get through those early shitty days early. And I'm sorry to use that language, but you, we need to get as fast through that as possible, which means we have to fund the business rate. You know that I was in a business a few years ago. And when we first started, it was a software company with some other owners. They had a very small mind in how much capital we needed to build it. And the number that they originally came up with, I'm like, we need at least five times that. Well, we're going to start, we're going to invest a little bit. And um, well, while they've been doing all of that, because I exited early, because I did not, it just wasn't being funded properly. So we weren't hiring the sales team we needed. We weren't developing fast enough, whatever. The market opportunity that we had when we originally came up with the idea, I guess six years ago, passed. Now they're building it, they're slowly catching up, but they're building towards a differentiation that's no longer needed. So speed is important for a lot of your business ideas. And so I wanna figure out what I need to do it. Do it. Uh, one of our clients, so let's talk about cash flow problems. Uh, they're in the, um, they're a franchise E in the fitness industry. They were opening up when we first met three locations a year. But man, the build out, you have to secure the, the, the license to be a franchisee in the market. You have to build out the facility. You're talking millions of dollars to open up a gym before you can even generate $1. How fast do you think you can grow that industry if you don't have a financial partner? You can't. So you buy your one location, you get your one thing going, and you suck to try to get out through the other side. You're just like this until you get enough members to get that going. Or you can do what my client did. And so we challenged ourselves, we need to 10x what we're doing today. So we want to add um, over the next year, one gym a month. Well, then we're going to have to raise capital. We need money to finance opening those facilities. While we're doing that, though, is we have to perfect the opening of the facility. So we did three things. First of all, we attacked pricing. In their existing gyms, they had a lot of members already. They had a good number of locations. And I challenged them on pricing. What can we do on pricing? And the owner's like, 
I can't do anything on pricing. I'm a, I'm a franchisee. I say, all right, let me get this straight. If as a franchise organization wide, we're not getting pricing right. You're telling me the franchisor doesn't want to make more money. Well, they do, but it's really hard. I said, all right, let's do, just do something quick. I want you to go look at your competitors' pricing schemes. They went out on the market and they figured out that one competitor that was having a lot more traction than them, it was a competing franchise, had a fourth price strata. So rather than the traditional three, they had a fourth one that was between the bid on the, the middle price and the bottom. So they said, you know what? They went to the franchisor and they said, can we test this? Because if we think if we're right, we can project and spin a lot more money off and people are going to make different decisions on pricing. Let us do it on one or two locations. Let's test it. So fast forward, nine, 10 months later, average dues. So same member, average dues. So average price we charge a member increased 20%. Now take that system wise. That from my client, he told me that changed his valuation just by making the pricing decision by 40 million. Yep. Now his investors are super happy, they're ready to double down. But by the way, by charging more and more oxygen that I don't even have to borrow against, and now out of my existing locations, I'm spending more 20% more cash on the average member because we made that decision. So that's not traditional cash flow thinking, folks, but you have to think about, it. I don't like how tight I am in cash, I gotta ask why. So many times your pricing is wrong. Business services, you want your pricing to be whatever your direct labor cost to at least be three to one. Most companies we go in, they're lucky if they're two to one. I'm like, how do you like your cash flow? Well, it sucks. <laughs> I got a bunch of money tied up in receivables. There's not money, much money left for me. And I'm like, well, your pricing's all wrong. So then what you find out is you've got a selling problem. You don't know how to sell value. So because you don't know how to sell value, you're underpricing. And the only people that are winning is the customer. So in that case, I'd say a cash flow improvement was learning how to sell value.